everyone. Um, it's good to see uh, such a fine turnout for what is unfortunately um, a presentation and discussion with, with mixed messages and mixed things. Um, we are going to, uh, I'd like to uh, also welcome um, to the stage later on, we'll be talking, with, we'll be hearing from them a wee bit later, Brett Murray from the Ministry of Business Innovation, Ministry of Business Innovation, yeah, I keep Works always missing one. A lot easier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Innovation and Employment. Um, and he'll talk about some of the changes that are happening in the regulatory regime. Um, and also Alistair Derrick from Duncan Cotterill, who's come all the way from two floors up, up the stairs, um, will talk to us about the legal situation and how uh, the Health and Safety Task Force's recommendations might emerge in terms of a new uh, regulatory framework uh, for directors. Excuse me. <coughs> so welcome. First of all, we want to start with, um, unfortunately, a very sombre message. Um, we, we are here today, this event is a direct uh, consequence of the Pipe River tragedy from late 2010. And I say that for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the first uh, of those reasons is that the, uh, the, sorry, the Royal Commission into Pipe River um, produced a very good report, uh, a very sobering report. But a big aspect of what they were saying there is that, amongst other failings, there was a governance failure at Pipe River. Um, and there were some very serious lessons for all boards and all directors um, in their report. The second reason that uh, this event is a, is a direct connection to that outcome is that uh, the government clearly accepted the Royal Commission's recommendations in full. <coughs> and when we had a look at the work that needed to be done, in particular in the governance space, um, we put our hands up to say we will be part of the solution to the problems around um, <coughs> advising um, and providing guidance to boards and directors. So the booklet that you've received today um, is a direct, uh, direct outcome. It's the first tangible outcome of the government's response to Pike River, which we had a very significant uh, role in helping to produce. And I do want to thank, um, in front of our members, Diana Price, who's down the back of the room, um, hiding <coughs> in camouflage. She dashed out as soon as I mentioned her. Um, uh, who had a, uh, worked closely with MB uh, to produce this paper. There's also a, a briefcase version of the booklet, which uh, for those of you who are members will have received along with your uh, boardroom magazine, uh, either in the last few days or that might be still on its way to you. <coughs> so moving on. Um, in terms of the case for change, uh, there are one or two workplace deaths in New Zealand every week. That's about 75 a year. And if you do the sums from November, t oh, sorry, 2010 when the Pike River tragedy happened, uh, we probably had another five or six Pike Rivers happen slowly, quietly, silently. Um, and that really is quite unacceptable. The financial cost is estimated at $3.5 billion a year. And even if you use the New Zealand Transport Authority's social cost of a life, of about, which I think currently sitting at about $3.8 million in terms of the sums that they do, you know, the 29 lives lost at Pike River represent more than a $100 million event in terms of social impact. So in terms of consequence, we pay attention to these big events. Um, and it's unfortunate that it, it does take a big event like this, but it has caused New Zealand to wake up and pay attention as to, you know, the parlous state of our health and safety performance. So mentioned up there, there's much room for improvement. Now, I didn't appreciate this until I saw some of the work the Health and Safety Task Force did. We're not just a little bit worse than our comparative countries, we're a lot worse. We're about twice as bad as Australia in terms of serious harm, and about five times as bad as the UK. Excuse me. So we've got a long way to go. Um, the Royal Commission made a few observations for boards. Um, the most significant of those from, um, from our perspective is that second bullet point where it said it didn't um, hold management to account for doing a good job. According to Nick Davison, who was the QC acting for the families in the Royal Commission um, process, um, on paper, Pike River had a world-class health and safety system. On paper, it wasn't implemented, it wasn't followed, and the board had thought they'd done their job in signing off the paperwork. Um, our four pillars document, which uh, of course you're all intimately familiar with, about 25% of that is devoted to, this, to the theme of holding to account being the role of governors. And um, that's particularly relevant um, in this context. Uh, 
Um, so we've got a couple of key messages that we'd like you to take away from today. The first one is the importance of leadership and tone from the top. And just to lighten things up just a little bit, how many people here have been to Manga Tanoko? And it's fine, fine establishment. Oh, not, there's quite a few people, I think, who aren't admitting it, I suspect, <laughs> given the proportion of responses received this morning. Um, there's a couple of things there. Um, for those of you who have been there, you'll be aware that the television ads don't quite set the right expectation in terms of the workforce demographic. But more importantly for today, um, that big brick building, which has become a feature of the, an icon of the, uh, of the Tui Brewery there, was built to implement a method of brewing Brewery? Brewery. 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 Um, you pour all the ingredients in the top, goes through all the machinery and beer comes out the bottom, which you know, for, for any guy is a, is a wonderful machine. Um, to me, I, I couldn't help thinking, um, and I'm not making this up, that's a really good um, illustration of what workplace culture is like. Whatever gets poured in at the top, at the governance layer, senior management layer, filters down right through the organisation, all the way through to the outcomes that your business delivers. As governors and directors, we have an opportunity to make real change here in health and safety. And in fact, um, the regulator can't do it on their own, even if they've got all the resources they could want. Um, it's really up to business owners and business leaders to effect the change we want to see here. I do believe, honestly believe, our profession is in the best position to make the greatest difference in terms of New Zealand's health and safety uh, performance, and it starts from tone from the top. As uh, Rob Yeager, who's the chairman of the Health and Safety Task Force, says, when my <coughs> boss tells me something, I'm interested. When his boss tells me something, I'm fascinated. <laughs> and I think, you know, as governors, we are the boss's bosses. Um, and the organisation will be fascinated if we are. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the other key message in terms of leadership that I want to take is that if the only conversations we have following today or following um, the outcomes of the changes are about compliance and about making sure we've ticked the right boxes, then we've failed here. Um, it shouldn't be just about compliance, although of course compliance will be important. It should be about showing that leadership, doing the right thing by our people and doing what society increasingly expects from its governors and its leaders to do the right thing. <coughs> The other key message that we would like to emphasise uh, today is that there's a significant benefit to having a, higher, a better health and safety performance. There's four points we've got up there, um, which are in many respects self or mutually reinforcing in terms of value delivered to business. A positive and robust culture does generate a better reputation. It does improve returns, it does reduce costs and you get an engaged workforce and an increasingly um, aware consumer um, purchasing behaviour which looks uh, very strongly at social and ethical responsibility of businesses. Now I've kind of given away my next question, which I usually don't do, but how many people have made a purchase recently where the ethical behaviours or the social responsibility or the environmental responsibility of the company you bought something from mattered to you when you bought it? Okay. I hazard a guess that's about a third of the audience here. I think that third's going to increase to 50% and go beyond. Mm. So you know, people are looking at you, and with social media these days, someone sees something they don't like, everybody finds out pretty quickly. <clears throat> In terms of roles and responsibilities of directors, there's only, there's only a couple of points I want to focus on here. Um, but increasingly, um, directors are being held to account for making sure their, their businesses deliver. And in the case of health and safety, um, as we said before, the Pipe River Royal Commission was very clear that the board did not discharge its responsibilities. The other point they made, which will get into areas that um, Alistair talks about later, is that they also said that the law didn't hold directors to account for doing their, doing their role effectively. From our perspective, um, good health and safety management is very similar to risk management. If you understand risk management and do that well, you should have no issue doing health and safety well. Um, it is your job to make sure um, management implement and that your system is working. <coughs> and I've um, got the, use the words due diligence up there, which is a theme um, relating to how directors' responsibilities are likely to be 
uh, constructed in the legislation which we may see later this year. I quite like the expression due diligence in terms of a director's responsibility because we understand what that means. We understand it means to dig and to keep digging and to get a level of assurance before you sign off on something. And in the case of health and safety, um, I'm expecting that that would be um, how you conduct it, excuse me, um, notwithstanding the law. The other thing I like about a due diligence is it incorporates a, con a concept of cost benefit and trade off and things that you that you're used to doing. I won't touch on any other points, but obviously um, a typical compliance framework will have the elements here and they're well covered in the booklet that you now have in front of you. From a practical perspective, knowing your business. Um, someone told me once that uh, 3M, who one of those M's or two of those M's are manufacturing and mining um, from the old days, um, used to produce or maybe they still produce explosives. And at the explosives production fed factory, the operations manager's house was right next to the factory. Now that's motivation. <laughs> it's also commitment. Um, I wonder how many mining company boards would hold their board meetings in the mine. Um, knowing your business is actually critical to getting it right. Um, the Pike River board, um, while having some mining experience, had no underground mining experience on the board. But is it any wonder that they weren't asking the right questions to probe and dig to make sure that what they were doing was safe? Um, so spending time on the ground um, has, has some benefits, not only in terms of understanding your business, but understanding the context within which proposals you're going to get and feedback about performance of health and safety gives, gives extra context and extra meaning. Absent. The other point I'd make, um, and this was um, uh, unfortunately also a failing of the Pike River Board according to the Commission, was that the absence of bad news should not be taken as good news. It could mean that your system's broken and you're just not getting the feedback that you want. Um, perhaps more concerning, it could mean that your workforce is disengaged from your framework and isn't providing information that it even knows about. So from our perspective, um, we're really keen for you to pick up these guidelines, test yourselves, test your boards, um, make sure that your companies are doing everything that they can in the space of health and safety. Someone owes me a two. Actually, that's not my favourite beer. Um, the other point, just going back to some opening comments I made in terms of the checklist and diagnostic questions, we don't want people to take a checklist approach to health and safety. So we think if you have ticked off the boxes, then you think it's finished, but actually it's an ongoing process. And so the questions and challenges that we've got in the booklet and the guidance here for you today are very open-ended and intended to get you thinking, which actually is what it's all about, is getting our brains switched on. Okay, that's it from me. I'd now like to welcome, excuse me, I called in the man from the ministry this morning, he said he wasn't the whole ministry and besides the name's changing. I'd like to welcome Brett Murray. Um, he can introduce uh, where he sits within the ministry and talk about um, where they're heading. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, so the, the plaudits for producing the, uh, the document that essentially we're here to discuss today uh, really sit with uh, Michael Papish from the uh, from ministry as, as well as Ralph and his team. Um, so the, uh, Michael's uh, current role is the director of Pike River Impl Implementation. He was a previous GM in policy. Um, so his role is to ensure, I guess, that the, uh, the recommendations of the Royal Commission outside of the new agency set up, which is, a, which is sort of was put to one side and has its own team, uh, were implemented. Um, and really, the, one of the, the first cabs off the rank around that was the was the director's guidelines. So um, uh, Michael's currently doing a roadshow around the country around the uh, consultation of mining regulation. So so uh, I'm stepping in for him. Um, but although I say that, um, these have been quite uh, close to my heart as well. Um, at the time of Pike River, I was actually a uh, regional manager with the Department of Labour based in New Plymouth, and my oversight was really around the petrochemical industry. Um, and when Pike River happened on the uh, 10th of November, um, I was asked to go down and head the investigation into it. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the outworking of that obviously is, is, is well known. What I want to talk about today is, is um, the group's role. I also want to share some personal reflections coming out of Pike River in terms of um, uh, directors and directors' responsibilities. Um, 
and uh, I won't touch too much. Um, these slides, unfortunately, have been prepared by Michael's team, so I sort of got them late. Um, so I will do a bit of ad living, um, and I won't touch much on the legal aspects of uh, some of the recommendations of the task force, um, because Alistair will touch on them um, in his presentation. And Ben Aloy is far better equipped than I am to, to do that. Um, So firstly, firstly the, the group's role, I mean our group's role essentially is about health and safety. So when it became apparent that the government was going to um, go with initially what was the, the Royal Commission's recommendations of setting up a separate Crown entity, um, the government asked the task force to advance that piece of work within their work program and basically come back and tell them whether that was a good idea, whether they agreed with it or not. So they duly did that, uh, Rob Jagan's team, and come back and said yes, we agree with that. Um, and so, so the, the actual go-ahead for the setup of the new agency came along quite early in the piece. Um, David Small, who's the chief executive of, of MB, because um, around the same time there was a whole boatload of work going on around the whole formation of MB as a separate um, super ministry, which David was obviously pulling together and heading. Um, and originally the health and safety group sat within uh, a broader regulatory space within the, the bigger MB group, which is you know, three and a half to four thousand people. Um, that's my mother on. Um, the, um, the, uh, what else? Where's the tool? What did he say your favourite thing it was, Rob? Right? <laughs> Goodness, now he looked by for the whole room. He <laughs> looked around quite accusingly there. <laughs> Um, so what, what essentially what David did in, in, in advance of that was to pull everything out, strip everything away from the health and safety group, apart from energy safety, which is going forward into the new agency, which we now know to be WorkSafe New Zealand, uh, that was announced uh, a week or so ago, um, and have it as a standalone um, group or division within within MB. So we've been working on that basis, and a lot of the work being done going forward is to not only set up the new agency, which has its own establishment team, but in terms of um, lifting our game program internally, um, building on what came out of Pike River and the task force recommendations. So yes, all serious harm and fatal incidents must be notified. Actually, in some high hazard areas, actually high potential incidents also must need to be notified. Um, but really, um, that is an aside. What, we're, what the group is about and what WorkSafe will be about is making um, New Zealand a safer place uh, for workers so that people go home, go to work at the beginning of the day and come home as well, or if not better, than they, than they went to work. Um, resources available. Um, we are changing our whole inspectorate. Um, we're looking at a, a quite a comprehensive program to lift both the capability and capacity of the inspectorate, but fundamental to that has been a splitting of the, the inspectorate of a particular role. So essentially a proactive in section of the inspectorate, our assessment team who will be going out to workplaces and uh, doing the educate, engage and compliance work, uh, and a reactive role which is, which is essentially an investigation team who will investigate serious harm. Um, there is a third aspect to that um, around a triaging group. Um, one of the things we'll be looking at doing for, 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 for incidents that drop below that serious harm threshold, uh, we'll be looking at a process called duty holder reviews. Now, duty holder reviews is a process where we'll be asking companies to, to do an investigation into the incident they reported, and we'll be overseeing that as a regulator. Um, there are some issues around duty holder reviews um, in terms of the current act. But, that, but we're taking the view around that this is about New Zealand lifting our game and, and we're looking to support businesses to better um, self-investigate. It's not about businesses self-regulating, but it is about taking responsibility and, and, and doing good investigations and, and incidents that happen within you know, the, the company um, uh, or, or the work site and then feeding that back into the system. So um, there is some information on the Keep Work Safe section of our website. The website's currently linked into the MB website. Um, there is uh, a draft in, in, into a net website for WorkSafe, which has been developed now, which uh, is looking quite good. Um, the problem is the agency's name, but obviously it's not uh, a real entity until it's, um, it's enforced in December. Um, prosecutions. Um, prosecutions is an end, a very end of the line in terms of any regulator's toolbox. Uh, they're hugely costly, they're hugely resource intensive, and they are reserved for stuff where, which is high culpability. Um, we, look to, we will be looking on the new agency, and, and actually we currently do, to educate and engage. One of the areas we'll be looking at improving markedly is our standard setting and guidance material. Um, that was also identified by the task force and the commission has been, um, it wasn't that we don't have any, we actually have quite a lot in some sectors, but there are significant gaps, so we've been doing gap analysis with other jurisdictions. Uh, and the Model work, um, Workplace Act that, um, 
that Alistair will talk about um, allows us a lot greater scope to actually um, pull in Australian regulations because they've been doing a truckload of work over the last few years and have a lot of quite up-to-date guidance material in various sectors such as construction, forestry, etc. Um, which wants, if, if the, uh, if, if the um, government decide to go with that model legislation, allows us to a lot easier bring that stuff over. Because the problem we have at the moment is, is tying it in with current New Zealand legislation and um, that, that can be quite difficult. Um, it's been well canvassed that we need to uh, change, to play our part in fixing New Zealand's health and safety record. But, you know, as the regulator and even the best regulator in the world, you can only ever be a catalyst and an engine for change. Um, you know, you can never, um, it's not, there, is a, there is a carrot and a stick aspect to that, uh, and how big the carrot is or how big the stick is, is going to depend uh, fundamentally on the sectors you're dealing with and the, and the type of engagement um, that's coming back to us as a regulator from, from the sectors. Um, the new operating model I've touched on, that's the new inspectorate model, greater specialisation, um, greater resources. We've been given an extra 37 million. It sounds, it sounds good, uh, and it is good. Um, but that's spread over a number of years to build the capacity of the inspectorate. It, it is money that, um, it is health and safety levy money, which the government had in the memorandum account, which we prized Treasury's hands off. Um, um, but obviously with the setup of the new agency, it's a whole different ball game. So there's a, the whole a new agency has been costed because the task force's recommendations went a lot broader than, than just the current role that, um, that we're doing within MB. Um it will become a Crown entity from De December 2013. Um, the government's quite clear on that. Um, so it's frantic work. Of those of you who have any dealings with legislation, um, the time frame is very, very short uh, between now and Christmas. I mean, this still stuff needs, it hasn't even had its first reading in terms of omnibus bill. There's a lot of work being done um, under the Crown Entities uh, Act to get that to get that underway. And um, Minister Joyce has determined that it will be in December. Um, it may not be in December the 1st, but it will be before Christmas. Um, establishment board will be appointed shortly. I think David Small is heading that and he'll make his recommendations to the Minister. And uh, they were looking to have their first meeting around the 17th of July actually, so that must, uh, this must be quite imminent to actually pull it together. Um, and in terms of the operating model at the moment, um, we've been working very closely with the establishment team and David and the Minister to ensure that all the work we're doing in terms of the changes we're making now aren't going to be thrown out on day two of the new agency. Um, and Minister Joyce has uh, set his expectations out quite clearly around the fact that this is a big change for industry and the agency, um, and I don't want a board coming in on day two and, and upsetting everything. Obviously there will be changes when you have a board down the track, um, but we really want to build on where we're going now. So the work we're doing now is actually the fundamental foundational building blocks to, to making that new entity successful. Um, just a quick schematic um, of what we're doing. I've, I've already talked through that, so I won't dwell on that. Um, the government's recommendation was a review of the law. Um, there's an omnibus bill going through the House, I think it's up for its first reading next month, but Alistair will touch on, on that. Um, provide guidance for directors, um, that's what we're here today. Um, it probably will be changed into a proof code of practice once legislation change has gone through. Um, and sitting with that is actually, um, coming out of the Commission's recommendations, was, a, was also a guidance or a proof code of practice for managers. And that, that was around um, for managers to build good safety culture systems within their businesses. Um, they targeted at mining, but it's equal, similar to the directors, but it's equally applicable right across the board, obviously. Um, and obviously directors to review and monitor compliance. And I'll sort of touch on that. Um, I, don't, I won't dwell on those, because um, Alistair's going to cover off on all of those. Um, current website is that. Um, actually, I missed out a bit, because uh, I was going to talk on something else. I must have flicked through too fast. It was this one here. Um, I just want to touch on the last point, directors to review and monitor compliance, um, and share some things coming to Pike River. Obviously, um, Pike River was the biggest investigation the department had, had ever done. Um, very quickly, as we moved into the investigation, um, it was self-evident that um, we had performed very poorly as a regulator, um, and that had, there was a lot of reasons for that. Um, but, but, but paramount. Um, for me, doing the investigation was that whatever we'd done in the past as a regulator, our investigation was going to be a damn good one. And that investigation took um, well over a year, and probably forms the basis for a, a well over a half of the, of the Royal Commission's report. And uh, as I mentioned this morning, I've been asked for copies of the investigation report, which we obviously can't give out because we currently have a prosecution underway. 
but uh, my response is generally if you read the uh, Royal Commission report on, on the what happened at the mine, um, you essentially be reading the investigation report. Um, now some of the things that came out of that, some of the stuff like everything doesn't get to, to, into the court setting and sometimes it doesn't even get into the, um, into the report setting because you end up, you have a, uh, at the time we had a six month time frame to lay charges so you're constrained by the statute of limitations. We obviously applied for an extension of that and you get one hit at that and we applied for another six months um, and, um, and we got that so we end up with, with a year to actually get the report up and running enough so that we have enough evidence base to, to lay charges, but we've actually continued the investigation to feed back into the Commission um, post that. Um, a few things that came readily apparent and, and, and to take cognizance of, and, I, and I'm, I'm really conscious here that when we talk about Pike River and you talk about stuff like Macondo, which is your, your, your Gulf of Mexico disaster, you are talking high hazard industry and not everybody in this room operates in that space. So if you're sitting there as a director of Glassons, for instance, for instance, you, know, you may be saying, well, what's this? You know, I can see that for BP and I can see it for Pike River. That's a little to do with me. But some of your real risks may not be in manual handling of people picking up boxes in your stores, but actually reps that you might have out on the road, as one of the um, directors alluded to this morning. And for a lot of businesses that perceive themselves lower risk, that travel and transport aspect of their business is quite critical. Um, and not everybody, if a disaster happens, um, you know, there's, there's the cost of compliance issue, but um, you know, we argue strongly that Health and safety is good. Is good cost. It's not a. It's not a cost burden, but is actually a sensible, a sensible investment in business. But that, that message is easy to sell, obviously, in a Pike River when you see what happens with the aftermath or a BP, where to save five hundred thousand dollars on an ROV cost BP twenty billion dollars in counting. Um, but it's also good costs in a number of areas around reputation. Uh, um, as we change the culture of New Zealand, and we've seen it with the drunk driving culture. Um, becomes unacceptable to, to drink drive it. Equally, it starts to become unacceptable to hurt people in places of work. Particularly if you're a subcontracting company and we're working with councils as who are big uh, principles around um, preferred, preferred tendering, which doesn't just mean lowest price tendering, but actually means looking at the company's complete work performance. Um, we had Lawrence Waterman over here from uh, the UK. He was the head of the uh, Olympic build, an $80 billion dollar um, um, 80 million man hours, uh, sorry, rather, build at the Olympic Village without one fatality, which is an outstanding result in the construction sector. And we're trying to use that model. We brought them out here to speak to the big companies down in Christchurch. Um, because with Christchurch, if we look at killing people like the rate of killing them in the construction centre over the Christchurch rebuild, uh, you could end up with another 60 or 70 dead, dead people on our hands, you know, to add to the earthquake toll that we already have. Um, so it is very real. It's not just words on a page. One of the things with Pike River was... Um, Russ already alluded to, was, was having people on the board who knew mining. Uh, they, had a, they had a board chairman who was actually from the energy energy sector, so he was well aware of the risks of high hazard industry, but asking the specific questions to mining. Um, Andrew Hopkins, who I also alluded to this morning, wrote a number of books on these major disasters, and this is equally applies to, to any business really, um, about what is the reporting line of your health and safety management team. Um, it may be small in a small business, it may be large in a large business, but does that line need to go up through the management chain, quite traditionally HR to the chief executive? So the only voice that the board is hearing on health and safety is coming from a single point of the chief executive. Or is the report that your health and safety team gives to your chief executive also seed straight into the to the board? So the board has the thing. So there can't be any filter in there, and the board the board has a full knowledge of um, of the issues that are coming to hand. Um, the other key area around directors which came in Pike River is change management, and particularly change management around senior management. Um, there was a photo on the wall of Peter Whittle and his, his team of senior managers, about 12 in all, um, which was taken about a year before Pike River uh, blew up. Um, at the time of Pike River blowing up, out of that 12, there was only 10 left. Uh, they had a complete almost change of management apart from Peter and Neville Rockhouse, and I believe, I think one other. Um, and of course, what happened to those people coming in? They come into a business that was, that was really... Um, in a bit of trouble, if you like, um, and the gap analysis for some of those managers coming in to actually the stuff they had to do to turn the Titanic around was huge. Pages and pages of read uh, of stuff that needed to be done. Um, so, you know, that change manager process of bringing people in and not just assuming that they're going to jump on board and pick up the role. A classic case in Pike River was around the uh, gas monitoring systems where we spoke to one manager uh, who was in, in charge of installing their gas monitoring. So these are the fixed gas monitors and the and the mine, and the question was asked of him, you know, so you, um, so you were in charge of the installation? And yes, um, and we went through the whole process of, you know, how did you source them, how did you ensure they're the right type, etc., which he answered fine. 
Uh, and what about the maintenance program uh, that you also run in? And his answer was, well, I didn't run the maintenance program for them. Well, well, who did? Well, I don't know, but it wasn't me. So who, so who went and looked at the calibration of these monitors and actually ensured that they were still working? Well, I presume, and some presumptions are that great, they're great thing. I presume it was somebody else. It turned out there was nobody else. So of the seven monitors, I think it was seven, um, there was two working, and one of those was slightly faulty, and that it was re really high. So these things can quite clearly creep into businesses. So change management is a, is a, is a key role. Um, and the, uh, the other thing, obviously, is the reputational challenge. Um, I've spoken to a number of conferences, and over in Australia, a, a drilling contractor came, came up to me and said, the problem with, with good reporting and having good incident management, I'll touch on that in a second also, just very quickly, is, is that if we report too honestly, we won't get the job. Because, because Chevron, he was talking about Chevron, want clean safety records, so I'm getting penalised. Um, so uh, the Australian regulator was working very hard with some of the big oil companies of saying, if you want honest reporting from your subcontractors, some of these were still big companies um, reporting to these mega companies. Um, if you want good, good companies reporting and honest reporting, then you need to be assured that the questions you need to be asking is if companies are reporting no near miss incidents in a high hazard industry, they're lying. Um, and, and they are the ones you need to be looking at, rather than penalising the companies who are reporting stuff well. Um, and so there's quite a culture shift happening in, in that space, and they've got to balance those, those risks out, obviously. Um, Incident reporting was another good one at Pike River, and, and I'd recommend any company in terms of the, a board, when you're looking at that, is, is where is your flow going at of incident reporting? One of the key complaints from, from miners, and we interviewed 300 miners at Pike River, was they would report incidents, they'd go up the chain, they'd never hear anything back, was anything, or very rarely. And if they did, it was quite arbitrary in, fa in the fact that a particular foreman was quite vigilant in doing it. But the, the, the organisation, although on paper, and Ralph touched on this before, um, they did have a system, it was a system that just wasn't followed. So incident reports would go up and actually they were quite good at that. They had these little stock booklets which every miner carried and they could write it out, tear it off and hand it in and on the face of it that was great. But when you actually track that, what happened to that going forward, it was very, very, very little came back. Similar to the maintenance program, you could pull out a maintenance record which would show a great tracking that on, this is the full maintenance program. When you tracked in what mate, was that maintenance done, well, no, because people peeled off towards other projects. So it's, it's managing those risks and having an oversight and actually talking, um, I guess, to the senior management about those key risks and the board having a knowledge of what are the key critical risks. For, and obviously they're going to be different for a high hazard industry than lower hazard industry, but what are the key risks for our, for our business? Um, so uh, I'm just conscious of my time, so I don't want to run on. Um, but adventure tourism is another area which I've, which I've spoken at um, quite a few occasions. And that is around... You know, how well do your customers know the real risks of uh, getting on the ride that you're, that you're giving them and how well do you know the key risks of the safety critical areas of your, of your business that you need to look at first. Um, I'll probably leave it there because uh, Alice is going to cover off the uh, <coughs> moment, but happy to take any questions later. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, now I'd like to welcome up to the uh, podium Alistair Derrick from Duncan Cottle, who's going to talk, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, about the emerging um, regime in terms of direct uh, liability, let's be frank, um, and how the law around that uh, uh, may evolve if the uh, task force recommendations that we adopt the Australian model law uh, get implemented. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'll just flip forward through to just to, just to explain my background first, and then I'll I'll come to the presentation. Um, I'm a litigation person. I deal with prosecutions. Uh, been dealing with them for about 15 years. Normally for insurers who are involved in the risk that a company uh, is facing, and we get the calls uh, when an accident has, has happened to help come in and deal with that, uh, supporting the company to work uh, supporting the, the victims of that, but also then to deal with the, ins the inspectors who are coming out on the ground, starting to talk to other employees and management. And then we go through to the cautioned interview process and then on into the court process where um, we've had a number of arguments with, I've had more than regular arguments with the prosecutors about what, what uh, was right and wrong, and then with the judges as well as we applied the legislation. So um, that's the context. 
this piece of legislation which has been contemplated is quite significant um, and it appears the government is they're going to respond to the task force in July but it seems as if they're going to take on um, most of the recommendations and that's uh, really the way the ministers are speaking so we think this is going to be very significant and particularly for directors because some of the changes um, the independent health and safety agencies is a, is a big step for the government as it moved into the super ministries um, it was amalgamating a lot of these functions and we saw Department of Labour move into MB and then to pull them back out again is actually quite quite contrary to the way the government was going. So they have taken the Pike uh, River, the, the Commission findings, quite seriously. They're moving in that direction. The repeal of the current Act uh, is suggested by the task force. The two acts, the Australian work, uh, model work uh, law, is a version of our act but it's just simply a later iteration of it the concepts are very similar to the current act but it's an updating it's all based on a, a, a professor from england who has this approach to overarching duties and overlapping duties and that the uh, recommendation is that we adopt the australian version simply because it's uh, it's been updated they've done a lot more work on it and it's the most recent version of it and there's other reasons for doing it, such as um, with closely economic relations with Australia, it'll, it'll set us well in place with that as well. It does include a separate duty for directors to exercise due diligence, which will allow um, uh, that to be an assessed by uh, the investigators and to be prosecuted if it's not achieved. So it actually places directors perhaps into that cautioned interview process, which I've been talking about. Separate regulation and monitoring of major hazard uh, industries, I think they can be identified, we know where the, the real, some of the more risky areas are, and then there's the increased penalties. My, my presentation is going to focus, um, the task force talked about carrots and sticks uh, approach because the, we need to make a step change with safety. Uh, they've talked about the carrots necessarily because I'm a, in the area I'm in, I'm going to talk about the sticks, but, but there are quite a few sticks in it. Um, and I, I do uh, except what Ralph is saying, that there is a very positive business approach to be taken. Um, what I'm going to say to you, there's significant risks if that approach isn't taken as well, and that's a good enough reason. Bo both are great reasons. Um, so forgive me my sticks as we step through them. The, the, the Act currently deals with uh, overlapping duties, and they're analysed by uh, how workers are actually in place, and we've got employers self-employed principles, the different, the different work relationships. The change in the model law is to, to broaden that out to person undertaking a business or undertaking. And it's really just trying to gather everyone in. So rather than talking about uh, you know, the, the investigators coming in to figure out why particular people are in place and what legal basis that is, they start looking at uh, who's conducting a business or undertaking and everyone they have control over. So it's going to, I think it will widen it out and it just changes the emphasis. The second change is um, about the move from all practical steps to reasonably practicable. The current test actually has a level of reasonableness in it um, because if you take all practical steps, the definition says, well, that's what's reasonably practicable in all the circumstance, sort of circumstances. And the most important one from a lot of the arguments I have is that the current definition includes the time and cost of dealing with the risk. So that's quite a, a significant, um, perhaps, reference point for what's reasonably practical. The new Act, uh, well, the new proposed Act, has the same sort of wording, but there's a significant change in the definition which the Australians is, are using. Instead of a reasonable, uh, reasonably practical steps, um, including time and expense, they now say uh, what's reasonably practicable and you must take account of the cost if it's grossly disproportional to the risk. So there's quite a change in wording and that, that's going to be a key element as we argue that the company can't afford to take a safety step. Um, the word grossly disproportional will be latched on by the prosecutors and the judges to say, well, that's, that, we, we give that some meaning. So. Um, uh, and I, I've had a lot of discussions with meat processing companies, sawmills, those sorts of things where guarding issues come up and you say, well, to, to re-engineer this whole business would, would put it out of business. Um, and that, that argument goes quite well in the context of reasonable cost. 
um, I don't think it'll go as well with grossly disproportional costs. That, that concept is going to change. Uh, the, other, the other wording they've changed is they, they've said that uh, rather than a hazard-based test, they want to move to a risk-based test. It's essentially, I think it is semantic, but <coughs> people seem to understand the idea of risk better than hazard identification. So um, they think it'll be a better take up by changing wording. If we talk about directors then, at the moment there's no positive separate duty on directors. There is section 56 which allows for a prosecution if a director has directed, authorised, assented or acquiesced in a breach. And there have been prosecutions under that section. And the key element is uh, proving, proving a knowledge, acquiescing, proving an involvement. Um, that's going to change to a positive ob obligation for directors to exercise due diligence. So that is a separate duty in the guiding principles set out there. And then on penalties, uh, we saw the, the Act changed, uh, I think it was 2002, when they increased the penalties five times. Fines did increase significantly. That was quite a, quite a big change as prosecutions uh, came in. Um, the fines are now going to go up to three million, and they categorise them slightly differently, but three million is the maximum penalty for a, rec a reckless uh, breach of the Act. Um, but essentially you've got this step change where judges again will take, will take, will recognise this, uh, this change and then really increase the fines. Uh, the other aspect is the adverse publicity orders as a new concept and that, uh, the only analogy we can see is the Fair Trading Act which allows for some adverse, uh, for a judge to make these orders. In the fair trading context, that would be to, to, to order corrective advertising if there's been misleading advertising. This is slightly different because the adverse publicity orders seem to be uh, arranged to punish. So they could be uh, billboard, they could order billboard advertising, um, newspaper advertising, website, uh, internet, uh, and also statements to shareholders. So essentially a judge may be able to move quite quickly to condemn behaviour which, which a judge believes to be um, to be needing of that. Corporate manslaughter, uh, they, they have changed, uh, the, they're talking about a change to the existing manslaughter provisions to make it easier for a, for a company, or they would change it to be charged with corporate manslaughter. Um, and that's based on this UK and Canadian uh, approach. And as it says there, there have been few successful prosecutions. The one that's listed there, Lion Steel, is 2012. There are two aspects to that. The, the fine you'll see is very significant, <coughs> maybe half a million, uh, 480,000 pounds. The first thing about that decision was the, the it was a fatality, but it happened in 2008. So it took through to 2012 to get a decision, so that company went through that process. The directors were also charged. They actually, uh, the company pleaded guilty to corporate manslaughter. The directors pleaded not guilty, and it wasn't until that point that the decision was released. The decision in itself is not, um, for corporate manslaughter, you need a gross uh, negligence or gross breach of duty. In this case, it was a maintenance man who had uh, gone to the roof of a building to repair a leak, and he fell through a, a skylight, and they found that the, uh, the procedures in place to protect that maintenance man weren't sufficient. So it wasn't their core business, it was it was uh, an add-on, perhaps a, a, an active employee taking steps too far. But when I looked at it um, and looked for the gross uh, behaviour of that company, um, for me I see a lot of companies who act in a similar way. So, so um, in the stark light of day it became gross, but for I, I think the difficulty for companies are that you can do ancillary activities and quite quickly get into dangerous situations without even realising it. Um, yeah, so charges under the current regime are relatively rare. If this change comes in, it will still be relatively <coughs> rare, but I'm sure this new group will want to, they've been wanting to prosecute more directors for a while. while. I've talked to the prosecutors about that because they want to get the message across. I mean, if this new legislation comes in, the same will happen. They will try and take some prosecutions to try and bring the message through. Uh, just a little bit of the technicalities. Um, 
corporate liability attaches to a company through the acts of its officers, obviously. So that would allow, the change would allow that to happen. So you get a corporate manslaughter. And then they have this uh, bridging of knowledge between two senior employees or officers to allow that the company then to be liable. So this is just to, uh, to make it easier to get that uh, knowledge attributed to a company. So the current regime, section 56, are prosecutions against directors, and that's currently the prosecutions are rare. Uh, Brett was saying this morning that they had considered prosecuting the directors of Pike River, uh, and they had a two-day debate with the Crown Solicitor about how, whether that was appropriate and whether they could get there, they decided not to. Um, again, the, the, the resources required for that sort of prosecution are very heavy, and uh, it, it is difficult to prove, and, and it's just a question of whether you, the department thinks it can get there, the ministry thinks it can get there. At the moment, the, uh, the fines have been dealt with in that lower range, and often conviction and discharge, that's because the company's also being charged at the same time for a breach of one of the other sections, so you get this an omnibus-style prosecution against the company, perhaps a director, perhaps even an employee at a senior level, and so the penalties against the company get taken into account and they say, well, the director perhaps shouldn't be dealt with too harshly on top of that. The, other, the, uh, the example which is there is a managing director who pleaded guilty and he was fined $30,000 and that was in addition to the fine against the company and in order to pay reparation. He was very closely linked to the company also. So he wasn't yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the, the managing director was the, it was almost as if he operated the whole business, I think. This was a cool store who put in, he put in a cooling system which was highly flammable, I think. Uh, the fire service was uh, called in when smoke was detected and I think there were eight or nine firemen on site when the coolant exploded and there was one death and about six or seven very serious injuries. Um, but it was a failure to, to check the system when it was put in and get it independently verified. It was put in by a contractor and it was decided that that wasn't sufficient when it went in. But also the warning given to the fire brigade as they entered the premises weren't sufficient, wasn't sufficient. So this idea of due diligence, um, I think the key is if this comes in, uh, the inspectors can ask a director to attend a caution interview and then they can ask that director how they have discharged their due diligence. So that, I think that's the key and to be able to answer that question you need to go through some of these steps. And uh, it's, it's about understanding the business from the ground up. Um, and I think these mirror very much where the Institute has come from with, with its guidelines, so I won't go through those too much. I think that there's a, an ability to rely on uh, consultants, health and safety uh, people, but the test will be whether that reliance was reasonable in the circumstances. And the difficulty is that accidents highlight the, inadequate, the inadequacy of the system. So again, every time you place reliance on someone else's view, it has to be a reasonable reliance is going to be the test. Oh, the, the other change is under, under the Australian Corporation uh, Law, yeah, I think it's the Corporations Act, a director and officer is actually defined quite differently and the proposal is we take up this model law definition um, and it's a person who makes or participates in making decisions. So it normally would take the CEO into account, he would be a, a director under this uh, proposed definition. And it can also take in corporate counsel, CFOs and senior advisors. And there's a, there's a, uh, it's difficult to, to create the dividing line between when you're advising and when you're participating <coughs> in a decision. Um, again, this is quite a significant change in the way we approach um, director's duties. So. It's just whether, whether the government decides to take this up fully. Uh, and then some practical tips. Won't go through those. They're very, they're very similar to the guidelines which the Institute has um, carried out. <coughs> I'll, I'll move on from those. So the key dates, the government's going to come back with its response to the task force uh, in July. And then again, the, the next, uh, the agency will be up and running by the end of this year. And that's the end of that. Thanks, Ralph. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much.